Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Yasmin Farshad. I'm the Practitioner Education Manager for Wise Women Herbals. And I want to welcome you to today's presentation, Herbal Actions and Applications for the, for the Nutritional Therapy Practitioner by Sierra Thompson Nordquist. Sierra is a nutritional therapy practitioner and herbalist in Eugene, Oregon, who specializes in bio-individual nutritional and lifestyle support for digestion, blood sugar management, autoimmune conditions, and mental health. Today, she will be going over common herbal action terms and preparation methods, flavors and properties of herbal botanicals, how to approach herbal use in your clinical practice, dosing, and utilizing botanicals in your functional clinical assessment. All attendees have the opportunity to submit uh, questions via Zoom chat option at any point during the presentation. We will address as many of your inquiries as we can at the very end. All the information provided on today's webinar is on behalf of the presenter. These statements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration and are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. And now I would like to welcome today's presenter, Sierra Thompson Nordquist. Welcome, Sierra. Hang on one second, we're having some technical difficulties on, on muting. Okay, Sierra, can you hear me? Sierra? Sierra? Okay. Can you hear me now? I can, you're a little far away. Okay, let me turn up the volume. Sorry about that, everyone. Thanks for your patience, everyone. Okay, how's that? Much better, thank you. Yes, of course. All right, well, thank you, Yasmin, and thank you everyone for being here with us today for our very first Wise Woman Herbals webinar. Um, as Yasmin said, my name is Sierra, and I'm a nutritional therapy practitioner and herbalist. And I have to say, I am very excited to be here with you all today. When I first learned that Wise Woman Herbals was working on creating a botanical fundamentals kit uh, for the Nutritional Therapy Association community in mind, I immediately knew that I wanted to be involved because I had been waiting for the day when an herbal test kit was made available to our community so that we could more easily integrate herbal botanicals into our practices and our protocol recommendations. So. Before we get started here, I just want to go through our disclaimer. So the information in this presentation is not intended to treat, diagnose, cure, or prevent disease. This information is not intended to be a substitute for the advice or medical care of a qualified healthcare professional. So you should seek the advice of your healthcare professional before undertaking any dietary or lifestyle changes. And please know that the material and information provided in this presentation is for educational purposes only. Now that we have that out of the way, I just want to give you a little 
bit of um, backstory about myself and my experience with using herbals in a nutritional therapy practice setting. So I have been an NTP and herbalist in a professional capacity for a little over three years. And I own and run my private practice, Nutritive Roots, where I offer individual and group programs, as well as classes and workshops. And as you can probably guess, these offerings revolve around nutrition, as well as herbal and lifestyle education. And in addition to this, I do bio-individual protocol recommendations, I create meal plans, and I also do topical nourishment consults. So in addition to these, um, I also work with eating disorder clients at a local mental health and eating disorder clinic. And I mention all of this because I have found herbal botanicals to be really an invaluable resource for nearly all of these clients because there are so many applications for herbal remedies that actually are more gentle and therapeutic to our bodies than a lot of synthesized medications out there. So don't get me wrong, there is of course a time and a place for medication use, and I am no doctor. Um, so herbal should not be misconstrued for alternatives to medications when medications are necessary. However, it is also equally important to recognize when this necessity exists and when it doesn't. So therefore, understanding some of the more um, amazing attributes of herbs can be an incredible way to support your personal health and the health of your clients. So a little backstory about what led me to nutritional and herbal therapy. Uh, since I can remember, I have had what I like to call digestive difficulties. And I distinctly remember the first occasion that I realized this. I was, I think, around four years old, and I was happily anticipating that year's Thanksgiving dinner. And while we were waiting, my sister and I decided to play a little game that we called Oliver. And so essentially the game went like this. I would walk up to her while she sat on the counter with the giant bowl of whipped cream designated for that evening's pumpkin pie. And I would hold out my bowl and say, please, sir, I want some more. And she would happily fill up my bowl with whipped cream and I happily ate it. And I kept going back for more. And I bet you can guess what happened next, considering I learned shortly thereafter that I am lactose intolerant. So uh, that was quite a surprise. And after this experience, I became very aware of how I never seemed to know if a meal or food was going to make me sick, regardless of whether or not dairy was present. And as you can probably imagine, this was both embarrassing and extremely frustrating because I couldn't figure out why my body seemingly couldn't digest the same way as everyone else's apparently did. And don't get me wrong, I love food. I have always loved food and I come from a very foodie family. So the fact that I always had a lingering cloud of anxiety around my meal times, especially when eating out, was quite a burden, um, really up through my, to my young adulthood when I finally discovered the power of nutrition and herbals. And it wasn't until I discovered my own bio-individual nutritional needs, as well as a particular bitter herb that I'll be discussing in more detail shortly, that my digestive function began to come back into balance. And I started to gain confidence again in my ability to eat without distress. And that's a pretty big deal. And we see how big of a deal this is for our clients who struggle with health dysfunctions every day in our practices. So I began my herbal training at the same time as my nutritional training. And so my nutritional philosophy and work has always melded the two modalities. And as nutritional therapy practitioners, we know the power of whole, properly prepared and nutrient dense foods. That's the pillar of our foundations of our philosophy. And as such, we're missing out on a whole brilliant world of nutrient dense adjuncts if we lack the knowledge of how to utilize herbal botanicals. Because let me tell you, we are hard pressed to find remedies that are more synergistically bioavailable to our human bodies than herbal botanicals. And with that being said, I personally decided to pursue an herbalist apprenticeship because I knew I wanted to know more about herbs, but most importantly, I wanted to know how to use and recommend them safely and effectively. So we must remember that herbs are powerful and they're multifaceted. And I knew enough to realize that I needed some guidance before diving into their uses. And honestly, that's one of the reasons why I'm so excited about this Botanical Fundamentals Kit with Wise Women Herbals, because it's a way to introduce these botanicals 
immediately into your practices while providing you as the practitioner with the quick reference information to help get you started and with making recommendations with confidence almost right away. So just like when recommending supplements, there is a bit of a learning curve, right? It takes a little time to familiarize yourself with a new product and determine what the optimized therapeutic dosing of that product is for each of your client's individual needs. And this takes a little time and research. So we want to approach botanicals in the same way, with curiosity and with caution, because each of your clients will respond in their own bioindividual manner, and each herb will have varying degrees of effect, depending on this bioindividual biochemistry and the person's personal energetics. So with that being said, there are common herbal actions and patterns in the botanical world that we can learn and use in order to more effectively determine what botanicals will likely work best for your client's health concerns. And of course, an excellent tool for this, um, you already have readily available with the functional clinical assessment that we as NTPs are trained to use. And I just want to note that I do realize that not everyone attending this webinar uh, is an NTP. So if you happen to want to learn more about this training and certification, please visit nutritionaltherapy.com for more information. However, I do want all of you non-NTPs to know that this information is absolutely applicable for you as well. So to get us started with understanding botanicals, I'd like to start off by discussing flavors, as this is a great way to familiarize yourself with herbs. I personally love this image of the tongue because it indicates the relative locations of the different taste buds that we have, which sense the various flavors that we are exposed to in our foods and herbs. And I don't know about you, um, but I love flavor. Um, it's a delectable, sometimes not so delectable sensation that we get to explore every single day. And every time we consume something, we are tasting it and we're experiencing that flavor. And this is really important when we're talking about both food and nutrition and herbs. So when we're using herbs, we can often tell a lot about how our bodies may respond to their use based on the flavor profile of the food or herb as it may be. So within your botanical fundamentals kit, all of the herbs within the kit are designated by flavor category. And within the kit, uh, as we'll review at the end of this webinar, you do get a herbal flavor wheel to refer to for easy reference on how these flavors can apply to the herbs you are testing and then using for yourself and your clients. So I'd like to do a basic overview of these five flavors because flavors in the act of tasting and smelling are critical to how our bodies respond to that food or herb. So there are five primary flavors that we'll be talking about today. Sweet, sour, bitter, salty, and pungent. And now you'll notice that in this image that there is a sixth flavor, and this is called astringent. And depending on who you talk to, this is often considered a flavor. Um, however, for the purposes of today's discussion, we will be talking about the astringent flavor sensation uh, during our herbal action section. So stay tuned for that. But we'll go ahead and get started um, with the sweet flavor. So sweet tasting herbs and foods have or tend to have a primary action of calming our nerves while also building our tissues. And they help to restore energy levels as well as support immunity by modulating the immune system. So we might commonly think of sweet foods such as fruits and dairy milk, um, natural sugars and grains, which makes sense, right? Uh, since these foods all have carbohydrate components that break down into glucose within our bodies, and yes, dairy is included here due to its lactose content, our uh, bodies end up registering and knowing what to do with these foods partially because of their flavor profiles. The sweet foods also include uh, cooked onions and squashes and yams and cooked cabbage and carrots, as well as parsnips. So we tend to be most familiar with sweet flavors, both in our food um, and also with some herbs. So what I personally love about sweet foods is that they offer more depth of flavor to savory dishes. And that's one reason why it's so great to combine sweet and salty or sweet and sour foods. Uh, the combination of these two flavors also helps to signal to our bodies, um, specifically our brains, that we are taking in quick acting fuel as carbohydrates. So we get a better boost in energy and nutrition due to the signaling. 
So if you find uh, that you have over sweetened a dish on accident, never fear, uh, simply add a salty or sour flavor. Uh, you can kind of think lemon or lime juice or vinegar for that. Um, as these more tart flavors can do wonders for brightening a dish's flavor profile, and this will help to lessen an overload of sweetness. Just wanted to throw that little culinary tidbit in there. Um, but with herbs specifically, the sweet flavor might not be so readily identifiable. However, you'll see that many herbs um, that you come across do fall into this category. So uh, some of these herbs are elder, elderberry, gymnema, skullcap, marshmallow root, slippery elm, mullein, ashwagandha, rhodiola, and salt palmetto. So next we have our sour flavor. And the sour flavor is one that some may not enjoy as much as others, uh, but you often don't need a lot of it to brighten up a dish. So like I mentioned before, if you like to experiment with cooking, you probably know that adding a splash of lemon or lime juice uh, or vinegar or even a little sour cream can add an amazing complimentary flavor to a meal. And sour flavors really depend on acidity, which is what causes our mouths to pucker and which helps uh, break down some of the components in the foods that we eat. So if you are new to experimenting with melding flavors, taste as you go. So you can assess how adding sour flavors changes the overall flavor of the meal. Uh, salt and sweet flavored foods can help soften tartness if you have over soured a dish. Um, and sour herbs in particular are great for digestion because they help stimulate the digestive process. In addition to this, they also help to build strength, partially due to their typically high concentration of antioxidants. So for these reasons, they help to cleanse the tissues while also supporting mineral absorption. So pretty awesome stuff. And some examples of sour foods are ferments, such as cultured dairy and sauerkraut, um, but also sour fruits like lemons and limes, of course, and vinegars, as I've mentioned. As far as sour herbs go, um, there are a few that come to mind, and these are blueberry, burdock root, uva ursi, and hawthorn. So next we have the salty flavor. And salt is, as we know, a flavor enhancer. And this is one reason why we tend to salt recipes to taste, because we're actually enhancing and teasing out the more low-lying flavors and aromas that are present in the dish and this can be really person dependent. So salt can help to balance out other flavors, such as bitterness, so as to make a dish more palatable and enjoyable, depending on your taste preferences. In contrast, uh, sweet flavors help counteract salty ones, as I mentioned. So if you happen to oversalt a dish, um, a few dashes of a sweetener like honey or even balsamic vinegar can go a long way in balancing out the flavors of your meal. And for salty herbs, these tend to be high in minerals. And more often than not, these will also affect the balance of fluids in the human body. So they'll help to lubricate their tissues as well as boost digestion. So some examples of salty foods are seafoods, of course, um, and vegetables, but also natural salts and um, foods like soy sauce or cured meats, um, olives, and even some cheeses, depending on the type. So two salty herbs primarily come to mind, and these are dandelion leaf and yellow dock. So now we come to the bitter flavor, and I personally love bitter flavors, but this likely isn't the case for everyone. And as with any bioindividual, we all have bioindividual flavor preferences, and bitterness is, of course, no exception to that. Uh, the human body, from a biological standpoint, is hardwired to be suspicious of bitter foods, uh, mainly because many poisonous foods tend to be bitter, or heavily bitter. So historically, humans could taste test unknown substances and could potentially avoid those with an overt bitter flavor in case it was inedible and or poisonous. So nowadays, we are more familiar with poisonous versus non-poisonous foods. And as it turns out, many foods and herbs that are bitter are actually quite beneficial to us. Uh, bitter flavors help balance out sweetness while adding a nice contrast of flavor. And if you ever find that a dish is too bitter, add some salt to it to help promote some of those other underlying less obvious flavors. So some personal favorite foods that have bitter flavors are dark chocolate, of course, um, but also coffee and horseradish, arugula, and kale. So bitter flavored herbs, are great at stimulating digestion 
and they usually have a draining and cooling effect as well, which can help to modulate inflammation. So there are a number of bitter herbs out there, and some of the ones that come to mind are guggle, globe artichoke, bugleweed, Oregon grapefruit, dandelion root, milk thistle, and rhodiola. And you'll notice that I mentioned rhodiola during the sweet flavor as well. And that's because rhodiola tends to be both bittersweet and actually a little pungent too. So you'll see that one come up in a couple of these flavor profiles. So last but not least, we have our pungent flavor. And pungent flavors tend to be another taste that is up for debate for many people as pungent foods and herbs tend to be very strong in flavor and taste. So pungent taste typically consists of a sensation of dry heat. Uh, and for this reason, it's common in spicy foods and many herbs and spices that we use readily all the time. So think onions and ginger and chilies and mustard greens and garlic, of course, um, and black pepper, that's a big one, but also cloves and cinnamon and even some grains like buckwheat and spelt. So pungent flavored foods and herbs and spices act as warming agents for the body and they're spicy. So some people tend to not like these as much as others um, for that reason, but they really help clarify the sense of food. That's that clarifying of the sense organs at work. Um, but pungent herbs also help enhance other flavors in a meal, and they really are great at kindling the digestive fire, which helps to promote absorption of nutrients and the elimination of waste. So many pungent foods, herbs, and spices are also diaphoretic, which promotes sweating. So for this reason, they are also beneficial for clearing toxins and promoting circulation. So we tend to have a nice sampling of pungent herbs in our culinary uh, spice cabinets, uh, such as garlic and peppers, as I mentioned. But certain herbs that are really great to use that are pungent are garlic and ginger, of course, but also chase tree or vitex and osha. And I'll be talking about both of these in a little bit more detail later. So now that we've reviewed the five flavors, it's important to recognize that these herbs do tend to have more actions within the body than the flavor primary action suggests. So for instance, elder and elderberry are sweet flavored herbs and they're immune boosting. However, they're also astringent and they're anti-inflammatory. So using the flavor actions as a guide can be quite helpful, but just know that most, if not all herbs tend to have additional actions and they may actually be applied in a clinical setting with these other actions in mind. So I keep talking about herbal actions, but you may be wondering what I mean by this. So considering the wide range of botanicals that are in existence, there appear to be common themes and herbal action terms that we can apply to various botanicals depending on their effects and benefits. So what I'd like to do now is take you through a quick summary of some common herbal action terms, which you will likely come across when exploring botanical applications in more depth in the future. And you'll notice as you continue your exploration of herbs that you'll come across other action terms and preparation methods that we will not be covering today. Um, I quite frankly simply didn't have enough time for them all. Uh, however, I think that these actions and terms that we'll be talking about today are good ones to start with as they cover many of the actions of the herbs to, that are found in your botanical fundamentals kit. And um, they tend to be actions that you'll come across frequently um, as needs for your clients. But of course, you'll notice some other action terms listed, um, both in the quick reference pamphlet that you have access to as a you know, register of this webinar. So definitely check out some of these other action terms. And if you are unclear on what some terms mean, by all means, look into it more um, so that you can learn more about the botanicals in general. So let's go ahead and go through each of these herbal action terms. The first term I wanna talk about are adaptogens, adaptogenic herbs. Many of you have likely heard this term before. Um, it's been gaining circulation in recent years, but generally speaking, it refers to something that helps bring the body back into balance and homeostasis. So often this rebalancing helps the body adapt to stress 
by increasing that person's stress threshold. However, it may work through other mechanisms as well to return the body to balance, depending on what is most applicable and necessary in the moment. So ashwagandha or Withenia somnifera is a sweet herb, and it is also a great example of an adaptogenic herb because it not only supports your adrenal glands in times of exhaustion and depletion, but it just generally has a nice anti-inflammatory effect. Um, it can be tonic and it also can be antispasmodic. So it really is helpful as um, an adjunct in these times of stress and exhaustion. And here on this slide, you'll see that we have kind of a, a quick reference for ashwagandha. And so that includes the flavor, energetics, as well as organ systems and the functional clinical assessment points that you likely will be able to use ashwagandha on. Um, we also have herbal actions and consequences of those actions, contraindications and dosage. So I just want you to know that we'll be going through a sampling of herbs today in this talk and they'll all be laid out in this fashion but please know that all this information as well as um, this information for the other herbs in the botanical fundamentals kit are included in the pamphlet that you should have received a pdf access to as registering for this webinar so just want to put that out there in case you're feverishly writing out notes so our next term is alternative and it really seems like everyone has their own definition of what alternatives are, depending on who you ask. Now, according to Merriam-Webster, alternatives are a drug, or in this case, an herb, that is used to, quote, empirically alter favorably the course of an ailment, end quote. So essentially, they help by gradually restoring proper and balanced functions to the body while promoting health and vitality. The definition I personally prefer is a substance which stimulates the body's own natural defenses in the presence of disease. So many may think of these as herbal antibiotics, but in reality, they don't act like antibiotics because they don't enter the bloodstream to kill invaders. Rather, they support the natural systems within the body in order to promote healing. So because of this, you might find that alternatives will bring on an illness, but will promote quicker processing and healing of that illness. So you're likely going to get sicker more quickly, but you're gonna recover more quickly as well. So alternatives are a bit similar to adaptogens, but their mechanisms of action are a little different and they are ideal to use at the onset of a cold or other illness. One of the herbs um, that you'll have access to through the Botanical Fundamentals Kit is an alternative as elder. And I did mention elder briefly when discussing the sweet flavor, um, but part of the reasons as to why it is such an effective immune booster is because of its alternative actions, along with its antiviral and anti-inflammatory effects. So another alternative herb in your kit is burdock root, Arctium lapa. And I like this herb a lot because it is a liver tonic and a disease aid, along with being a lymph strengthener. And as we know, our lymph system is what helps our bodies combat illness. So this can be a really nice option for you and your clients when addressing chronic illnesses. So our next term are aromatics. And aromatics, I have to say, are pretty darn cool because they possess a fragrant aroma and odor. And I say odor because some aromatics really don't smell great, while others smell amazing. And this is because aromatics contain volatile oils that escape from liquid form into the air. So um, if, for instance, a bottle of essential oils are left open, right? They kind of lose their fragrance. And this is the same case for all aromatics. And all aromatics are both dis uh, disinfectants and astringent. And for instance, you can make some powerful toilet bowl cleaners with concentrated aromatics. Although I don't recommend doing this with any uh, tinctures, you're gonna wanna use concentrated essential oils for that. But I do like to mention it just to have some fun exploring with their uses. So when you have an aromatic herb, you can know it will have a digestive benefit because it brings attention to digestion through the act of irritation. And this might sound counterintuitive, but in reality, it can be quite helpful because by causing a slight irritation in the GI tract, you end up bringing attention to that area by promoting blood flow to the area of need, 
and subsequently promoting healing and balancing actions in that area. So in contrast with bitters, which we'll be talking about shortly, um, bitters are cooling, whereas aromatics are warming to the body. So as you explore these uses, pay attention to the sensations that you experience when trying aromatics versus bitters. And you will find that there are many aromatics that are also bitter aromatics. So um, there's gonna be some overlap there. And one thing I do like to mention about aromatics, which is one thing that makes them so cool, is that they often excrete through the system that they act on. So I'm sure many people here have eaten asparagus before, and we know what asparagus does when we urinate. We smell asparagus. And asparagus is a urinary aromatic, and so that's why we smell it when we urinate. It comes through our urine, and it's acting on the urinary system. So as far as um, herbs go, osha, or Ligusticum porteri, is a pungent herb, and it's one of my favorite aromatics. And this one is great because it excretes through your lungs. It's a lung aromatic. And as it turns out, osha is an amazingly effective herb for respiratory infections, as well as congestion and ailments. And you can actually taste it as you breathe out the flavor of that herb. And this one is excellent for uh, lung congestion, any kind of sinus pressure or pain, um, as well as coughing fits, whether it be chronic coughing or acute coughing. It's excellent for respiratory infections. And so this is one that I recommend frequently in my practice, especially if a client comes in and they're you know, having a lingering cold and they just can't quite kick some of the coughing and the congestion that's lingering. This one is excellent. Um, because it is pungent, it is a very, very flavorful pungent. And so um, definitely put it in a little bit of water before um, having your client take it. And then tell them to expect to taste the flavor because it is a good one. Um, some might not like it as much as others, but it is very helpful. So definitely give this herb a shot. So I've mentioned astringent a couple times, so I would like to go through kind of what that means. So astringents are some of the herbs that I personally use most in my personal life, mainly because of their ability to dry, draw, and shrink swollen tissues. So they're pretty applicable in many scenarios. And this ability can be amazingly effective for practical applications, such as using on bug bites and stings and splinters, but also inflammations, both internally and externally. So one example might be for swollen tonsils or mouth sores. Um, astringents are really great in these instances. Um, probably my favorite one to use in this moment um, is red root or ceanothus, and uh, it's an astringent as well as being a lymph support. So by adding a dropper full or two of that tincture to some water and then swishing or gargling it to coat the affected areas is amazing for soothing that irritation and the inflammation. And really just helps draw out any um, swelling that has occurred. So in addition to this, many plant astringents contain tannins, which readily bind with other chemicals and compounds so that they don't actually get absorbed into the bloodstream when used internally. And this is important because they help soothe and reduce inflamed membranes, both internally and externally. So as a topical, uh, tannic astringents like black tea, for example, are amazingly helpful for sunburns because the tannins bind with the compounds in the broken epithelial tissues to create a protective and healing layer on the sunburn. And what is inflammation in the body but an internal sunburn, right? And it's an internal irritation that has become swollen and inflamed. And so astringent uses can be excellent for this type of inflammation. So rhodiola is one of the herbs in your kit that um, has astringent actions, but it's also adaptogenic and aromatic. And you'll notice that when you try rhodiola, that your mouth will likely pucker a bit um, and become a little or a lot dry, uh, depending on your personal uh, response to it. And this is that astringent action at work. And as I mentioned, some modalities of alternative medicine actually classify astringent as its own flavor because of this drying aspect that 
it causes in the mouth when tasted. So another astringent herb that I find to be quite helpful is yellow dock or Rumex crispus. And this is a salty herb. And it's especially useful as an astringent for bleeding bowels in particular, um, as well as reducing inflammation from acid reflux and esophagus. This is especially true when combined with demulsants, which I'll be talking about in a moment. And we all know, if we've ever had acid reflux or heartburn, how irritating it can feel in our throat and our esophagus. You know, those membranes are pretty sensitive and they don't like having that exposure to the stomach acid. And so we can get a lot of inflammation in our throat. And an astringent like yellow dock is really helpful for soothing that irritation. However, in addition to all this, yellow dock also helps boost liver function in order to reduce overall congestion. So it's gonna be a helpful digestive uh, support as well. So there are many astringents out there, and you might find that you prefer uh, one over another depending on the concern being addressed. So definitely explore this a little bit more uh, deeply. So bitters, uh, now we get to talk about bitters. And I think out of all the action terms for herbals, bitters are the ones that I refer to most, mainly due to their ability to effectively assist with the digestive process. And having learned about my digestive issues in life at the beginning of this webinar, you can probably guess why I personally love bitters so darn much. Uh, they have been a critical component to my personal digestive healing and my ability to actually be able to eat without distress, which is a huge deal. And as NTPs, we know how foundational digestion is to overall health. So I hope you love bitters as much as I do because they are powerful and they're effective supports for digestive function. So the main thing to know about bitter herbs is that they work by a taste reflex, which we all should be familiar with due to the lingual neural testing that we're all trained in through the NTA. However, with bitters, because they work by taste reflex, we often don't need to take a large quantity of them in order for them to have a digestive benefit in the body. So one of the reasons why bitters are beneficial for digestion is that they promote peristalsis, which is the wave-like muscle contractions that help move digestive food particles through our GI tracts. And in addition to this, they subsequently improve the muscle tone of the GI tract so that these contractions and the expansions can occur more optimally in order to improve overall digestive function. And I also want you to think when you're thinking of bitters is to think about timing. Bitters optimize the timing of the release of digestive secretions such as saliva and stomach acid, digestive enzymes, bile, mucus, etc. You know, additionally, they also will help to reset the timing for hormone release within the digestive tract, which we know can be highly important for proper digestive and just general overall body functions. So not only do they do all of this, but they also promote immune system responses so that we respond more readily and appropriately in immune uh, issues. And this is because approximately 80% of our immune system is found in our guts. So overall, as you can see, bitters are kind of a big deal. So definitely um, test out these options because they're kind of amazing. So my personal go-to bitter is Oregon grapefruit, Mahonia aquifolium. And Oregon grape is just awesome, um, partially because it is local and native to my area here in Eugene, Oregon, but it also has so many amazing actions in the body, um, including, of course, the ability to return the digestive system back to balance, as I've been mentioning. So it will assist with the timing of digestion so that your gallbladder is squeezing at the right time for optimized fat breakdown. Your stomach is producing stomach acid and digestive enzymes in appropriate quantities and at the right time. And your pancreas is primed and ready to release its contents when the chyme is passed into your duodenum. So all of these are great. And Oregon grape does all of this and more. And I do always warn clients ahead of time that bitters can influence bowel movement and stimulate digestion, right? It promotes peristalsis. So it's really not unusual for either you to get hungry or need to have a bowel movement within 15 to 20 minutes after tasting Oregon grapefruit. And I don't know about you, but I think this is awesome. 
Uh, and your clients will think this is awesome too, especially if they struggle with um, perhaps a lack of appetite first thing in the morning or um, maybe constipation. And they really have trouble having that first bowel movement of the day without a cup of coffee. So this herb is great in those instances. And this really is the herb that I found helped me most in solidifying and really stabilizing my digestion. So there are multiple bitter herbs out there, um, and many of them you'll find have slightly different actions um, and uses depending on their own unique and targeted applications. So have fun exploring with these because I know I did and I continue to do so. So next we have demulsants and emollients. And these action turns go together because they indicate that an herb is primarily soothing to mucous membranes. And they're handy for calming gastric irritations, such as GERDs or stomach ulcers. And they also tend to provide some beneficial prebiotics to our gut microflora. So the difference between demulsants and emollients is simply that demulsants are used internally and emollients are applied externally as a topical. So, one of my favorite go-to demulsants um, is slippery elm or Ulmus rubra. And this is a sweet herb and it's cooling and moistening. And part of that, the reason for that is because it promotes uh, mucilage production. So it helps coat our mucous membranes um, really in the entirety of the digestive tract as well as other membranes throughout the body when we take it internally. And that's because it helps promote the mucus production in these membranes as well. So slippery elm is uh, provided as a tincture in the botanical fundamentals kit, uh, which is really great for testing purposes. However, I do encourage you to try a cold water infusion with the dried bark. So this simply will look like taking one tablespoon of dried herb to eight ounces of cold water. And um, usually I'll make about a quart at a time and steep that for four plus hours or overnight, as that might be easier. And I want you to do this mainly because it's very revealing as to how much mucilage slippery elm can actually create. Uh, you'll end up with a, little, a bit of a snotty consistency, which um, I know sounds gross, but it is quite effective. And I do want to mention that not all demulsants are snotty uh, or mucilaginous, but slippery elm certainly is. And uh, marshmallow root actually is as well. And this is another uh, demulcent herb that is included as a tincture in the Botanical Fundamentals Kit. So test these out and see which ones you and your clients like to use. Um, if you or your clients respond well to the tincture, then you'll likely respond well, if not better, to the cold water infusion too. So definitely look into that. So our final term for today are nervines. And nervine herbs are absolutely your friends and they will be great friends for your clients as well. Uh, nervines are amazingly effective and impactful to our nervous systems and our adrenal glands. And for this reason, they're both stimulating and can also be relaxing. So you can tailor your use and recommendation of these nervines depending on how you or your clients are needing support. So probably my current favorite nervine is skullcap or scutellaria lateralifora. And those of you who know me know that I recommend this herb all of the time. Um, I rarely leave the house actually without skullcap and orchid grapefruit just because I never know when they might come in handy and they're quite handy. So I love having them on hand. And Skullcap in particular helps assist with calming circular thoughts and ruminations. Um, so for you, your clients who have trouble going up to sleep because they're thinking about their to-do list for the next day or they're thinking about um, past upsetting memories or experiences that are just preventing them from going to sleep. Skullcap is awesome in these instances. And not only that, but it helps relax the musculoskeletal system. So it can be really helpful for um, menstrual cramps, for an example, or just sore muscles in general. And overall, it just helps relieve anxiety and can be helpful in acute times of need, such as panic attacks. 
So it's very helpful and it's also a gentle herb. So this is a great one to try whenever you have clients with anxiety or stress and or agitating circumstances. And I have had clients come into my office visually agitated and almost trembling from the stressors in their lives. And in these moments, I, I often will ask them, would you like to try this herb called Skullcap? Um, see if you experience some relief. And many of my clients do know to expect this from me just because they know I'm an herbalist and um, like to make these recommendations. But if they say yes, in, in the times that I tried this, within a few minutes, their visual agitation calms to the point where they're able to sit calmly and relaxed for the remainder of their consultation. So this herb is pretty awesome and I cannot say enough good things about it. So definitely give it a try and be sure to let me know what you think. So I do want to go ahead and briefly talk um, about some of the various herbal cultures. And I'm hearing some background noise. So um, Yasmin, if you could just make sure everyone's muted, that would be great. Thank you. Um, so I want to just briefly talk about some of the herbal preparations because in order to use herbs, you really want to know what the best way is to use them. And knowing the proper preparation method for the herb in question is really important to know. So this slide offers an overview of the most common preparation methods that you likely will come across in your research. So I do encourage you to start familiarizing yourself with these various preparations. Um, of course, you know, for example, with the Botanical Fundamentals Kit, um, all of the herbs are in tincture form. And as you can see, tinctures, as detailed here, are usually alcohol extracts of either fresh or dried herb that have infused in the menstruum, again, typically alcohol, for about four to six weeks. And this requires daily agitation in order to promote an effective extraction. And I love the way that Wise Women Herbals does their extraction process. So if you ever get the chance to tour their facilities in Crestwell, Oregon, I highly recommend it as I personally found it to be quite enlightening to see how thorough their processes are. So very quickly, I just want to go through these. We have infusions and decoctions, and these are what we're going to think of typically as tea. You know, they're water um, extracts. So infusions simply mean that we're using kind of the aerial portions of an herb, so the leaves and the flower parts, and they typically are um, less tough in nature, and so they don't require as long of a steeping period. So this could take um, about three to five minutes usually, depending on the herb in question. And then we have decoctions. And you can think of decoctions as um, an extraction for more woody parts of herbs. So underground parts such as roots or even barks. Um, these really require typically a lengthier boil or simmering process, which can take um, about 30 minutes, depending on the herb again. So, then we have glycerides and vinegars, and these are two um, non-alcoholic extraction options um, for perhaps for clients who can't tolerate alcohol. Um, I personally have worked with a number of clients with alcohol addiction, um, whether currently or in the past, and so alcohol tinctures really aren't the right modality for them. So in those cases, I'll oftentimes recommend glycerides or vinegars as an alternative. And so glycerides is used simply using um, a glycerin for the extracting menstruum and vinegars, of course, are using vinegar. And I find that vinegars are best for extracting minerals from mineral rich herbs. So, uh, for example, nettle is a great mineral rich herb. And if you do a nettle vinegar extraction, you can use that vinegar in uh, salad dressings or you could just take it uh, tonically, you know, in a little little tablespoon shot glass kind of style. And it's great for getting some of those, uh, not only the herbal actions of nettle, but also the minerals that are present in nettle. So then we also have our syrups. And this oftentimes is a combination of honey um, along with an herbal uh, extract that's been extracted either in vinegar or tincture or um, sometimes even a strong infusion. And then we have a couple of topical applications. So we have compresses, which is when you take a cloth and you soak it in a strong infusion or decoction and then apply that topically. Uh, this can be quite helpful in cases of sunburns. So I have used this um, for personal sunburns where I'll make a strong infusion of a black tea and then I you know, soak a cloth in it and I wrap it around that sunburn in question. 
And then poultices are also topical, but these are when you take herbs and you macerate them, and typically with a little bit of liquid, either your own saliva or uh, another menstruum, and then you apply it to the area of need and wrap it in a cloth so that it stays put. And then the last one that I'd like to mention, just because it's a fun one to play around with, are um, pastilles or herbal lozenges. And these typically are prepared using a powdered form of herb and then mixed um, to a paste-like consistency with water and honey so that you can um, then roll them into little balls and have some herbal lozenges handy. So again, there's lots of preparation methods out there. These are just some of the more common ones. Definitely um, check them out while you're exploring the uses of botanicals. So we've been talking a lot about using botanicals, but you're likely wondering how you dose them. So as with any supplement recommendations that you make, you want to thoroughly research your botanicals before recommending a dose. And this is because almost every herb has different actions depending on the quantity used. So I've been talking a lot about Oregon grapefruit, and so I'll go ahead and use this as an example for dosing. Uh, because it is a bitter and it works through taste reflex, you only require a few drops of it right on your tongue for it to have a digestive benefit. However, Oregon grapefruit can also act as a pretty strong uh, liver support stimulant. And this is, really only happens if it's taken in a larger quantity. So this quantity might look more like three dropperfuls, which um, equates to roughly 60 drops of tincture. And this is really awesome to know, especially in the cases of hangovers. Uh, but taking this herb at this quantity for more than a two week period is really not recommended because it is a very strong liver stimulant. And so in cases where you're gonna be needing a liver support for longer periods of time, I might go with a more gentle liver um, support, such as milk thistle. And um, specifically milk thistle glyceride is my favorite, and I'll talk a little bit more about that shortly. So as you get to know and cultivate your herbal relationships, I highly recommend you utilize a trusted reference or two or several, this is just me uh, justifying my extensive herbal library, um, but it's great to have some reference material on, on hand for determining starting doses. This is really be person dependent, so it's nice to know where to get started and then you know, either titrate up or titrate down depending on the client's needs. So you'll hear the term standard dosage a lot, and um, this essentially equates to uh, roughly 60 drops or three dropper fulls of tincture. And I do, do want to mention that within the Botanical Fundamentals kit, there are 25 herbs included, and they are all considered to be gentle botanicals. So you'll find that most of their dosing does fall into this range. However, if you begin exploring botanicals outside of this kit, and I of course encourage you to do so, uh, you must be aware of drop dosage botanicals because they can be dangerous if they're not well understood. So drop dosage botanicals are very, very strong herbs, typically, that often are poisonous if taken in large quantities. And these large quantities might not be so large. Um, you know, sometimes exceeding more than five drops can be too much of a particular herb. And I'm really not going to go into too much depth about examples of drop dosage botanicals in this presentation, but I do want to make sure that you're aware of the term and the importance of understanding botanicals before making dosage recommendations. So as I said, you know, if you're just starting out with botanicals and you're purchasing the Botanical Fundamentals Kit, again, just know that they are all gentle herbs, uh, meaning that none of them are drop dosage or low dosage. And this was intentional so that you don't have to worry about um, this aspect with your kit herbs. But however, I do want to mention just some of the effects to expect if you do start using low dose herbs. So um, if you overdo it with a drop dosage botanical, um, some herbs, you know, the worst that can happen might be excessive diarrhea and some vomiting. Um, others might cause some musculoskeletal cramping. Um, and then some other ones might actually be poisonous and could cause death if overconsumed. And I'm, I'm not telling you this to scare you, but rather inform you so that you can do your due diligence when embarking on a new herbal relationship, as these herbs can still be really helpful adjuncts if they're used in the appropriate, appropriate quantities. So with this being said, I don't want you to be fearful of using low-dose herbs in the future once you feel more comfortable and confident with the use of botanicals. 
And again, research is the key here. So for example, um, black cohosh is a commonly heard of low-dose botanical that is historically beneficial to the female reproductive system. And I just learned this last week, actually, from one of my herbal mentors, that female reproductive herbs, such as um, black cohosh or vitex, uh, that they work more optimally at lower doses, but in formulation with other liver supports. Because by boosting liver function, you actually help to lay the foundation of supporting the processing and distribution of hormones that is necessary to avoid pelvic congestion and then other reproductive imbalances which as we know, are impactful to the uterine and ovarian systems. So this is a great example of using um, low-dose botanicals such as black cohosh in combination with a liver support that is a little bit more gentle. And you can formulate this so that you have, um, you know, maybe about five drops of black cohosh to each dose taken of the formulation. So it's really awesome to be able to make these combinations because they're really quite effective for a number of conditions. So it's really neat to think about how you can use low dose botanicals in combination with these other um, higher dose herbal supports that are perhaps a little bit more gentle. So again, use caution here. Don't explore with herbs that you don't understand, but just know that many things can be toxic if overconsumed. And of course, herbs are no ex exception here. So. Please don't let this understanding prevent you from exploring botanicals, but I just like to mention it so that you are aware that this is something to um, be aware about when you're exploring. So we're getting a little close to time and I just wanna finish up with talking about how you can use botanicals specifically with the functional clinical assessment. So part of the reason why uh, the Botanical Fundamentals Kit um, came to conception was that we as NTPs uh, really can find it helpful to have an herbal test kit available that we can use in our clinical practices. So the kit was constructed in such a way as to provide botanical options that will cover the scope of the functional clinical assessment. And uh, for those of you who have um, perhaps graduated previously um, from NTA, that functional clinical assessment is simply the new term for the functional evaluation. So within the kit, we have herbs that really cover the gamut of all of the palpation points that are LMTable. So as attendance of this webinar, you have received a PDF of the Herbal Actions and Applications pamphlet uh, created by yours truly that outlines what botanicals to try for each LMTable palpation point. So on this slide, you'll see a portion of this page from the pamphlet to give you an idea of how the information is laid out. And I decided to show the digestive points as we, of course, almost always start with digestion. So you'll see that we have an organ system category, an LMTable palpation points category, and a testable herbs category so that you can more easily and quickly identify which herbs may be best used on these points. So when using herbs with a functional clinical assessment, approach their use from a root cause perspective. And what I mean by this is ask the question, what foundations are in need of support? What root causes might be at play here? And remember, cascade effects and what other systems can be supported through the nourishment of these foundations, right? So these foundations are digestion and blood sugar, minerals, fatty acids and hydration, et cetera. And I almost always personally start with digestion because as we know, this is really the foundation of our foundations. Yet sometimes clients really aren't ready for major or sometimes even minor lifestyle shifts um, that will best support their foundational health. So you can think about herbs that can help provide a more immediate relief from symptoms so that clients are better able to implement these shifts. So sometimes herbs can be quite helpful as band-aid supports in the immediate moment. Uh, so for example, ginger is a great example for um, clients who struggle with nausea, as this is a warming and a pungent herb, and it really helps to stoke the digestive fire so as to have an antiemetic effect. And I personally see a number of clients who struggle with nausea, and they really have difficulty eating due to its persistence and the client's inability to distinguish um, nausea from perhaps persistent hunger. So ginger and other bitters can be really helpful in these instances for calming that nausea. And I, of course, already mentioned Skullcap as a great nervine for generalized anxiety, uh, which can really be a nice, uh, usually non-drowsy option that can help soothe uh, any kinds of aches or cramps and calm some stress responses in the moment. 
So that's on one hand. And on the other hand, we want to think of how herbs can be helpful in a more tonic capacity. So I briefly mentioned milk thistle earlier, and milk thistle is a great um, herb for being a gentle yet effective liver support. So general processing and distribution of nutrients and wastes can occur more effectively. And generally, this is going to tend to boost a person's energy. And as a nice bonus, it helps improve skin, nail, and hair health as some of its many benefits. And this actually is especially true when you combine the use of milk thistle with essential fatty acid supports like fish oils. So I do wanna just mention that um, if you do try milk thistle, uh, try the milk thistle glyceride, uh, especially if you or your clients struggle with the bitter flavor of the alcohol tincture. Um, I like to think that it tastes, um, the glyceride at least, tastes like an herbal lemon meringue pie. Um, and as milk thistle is helpful as a tonic herb, tasting the bitter flavor is a little less imperative in the moment. And even so, your bitter taste receptors will still take note of the bitter flavors in the glyceride. They'll just um, be a little bit more modulated. So I, of course, also want to mention that herbs are highly bioindividual. Of course they are, because we are too. So even though an herb statistically acts in a certain manner of support, this may not be the case for you or some of your clients. So if it's not the right herb, just look into other options that might work better for that client's or for your bioindividual needs. So to wrap things up, I just wanna give you a little visual of what you get with the Wise Woman Herbals Botanical Fundamentals Kit. And as part of our promotion, um, they are offering a special kit pricing. And this is a steal. And you get 25 single herbs um, in tincture form, in one ounce bottles. And not only that, but you also get a really great reference tool uh, for this um, herbal flavors wheel. This can be really great for just quickly taking a peek at you know, the herb and some of the actions that it likely will have. Again, you have access to the PDF uh, pamphlet that I created that has uh, quick references for each of these 25 herbs. And one aspect that I think is really great is that we have these herbal botanical cards. And one thing that we oftentimes um, forget to do is really learn more about the herb that we're using. So these cards are great because they give you a visual not only of the plant and the plant part that you're using in the tincture, but it also gives a nice description on the back of where they're grown and how they are harvested. And um, then if you find that a client responds really well to an herb um, by testing through the tincture, but perhaps for whatever reason they don't want to use alcohol, you can refer to the back of these cards and it actually gives you a little list of some of the other products that Wise Woman Herbals um, creates that might not um, be in tincture form. So you can think about some other ways to uh, promote the use of these herbs without it necessarily being an alcoholic tincture. So thank you so very much for joining us. Um, it's been my pleasure being here with you today. And I um, just want to uh, thank Yasmin and Wise Woman Herbals again for um, allowing me to um, be part of their first webinar and share some of this awesome information with you. So um, before we finish up, I do want to just open the floor to some questions. So um, Yasmin, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. And um, if you could read some of those questions out, that'd be great. Sure thing. Thank you so much, Sierra. And thank you again to everyone um, being patient with our technical difficulties today. Um, we are kind of running short on time, so we'll have some time for just a couple of questions. And then any additional questions, um, please feel free to contact Sierra directly, and that way she can uh, better assist you with your inquiries. So we have a question from Nicole. She says, I've often read to steep infusions for four or more hours. Can you speak to that? So um, oftentimes when you are doing a strong infusion extraction, that is important for medicinal benefits. Um, however, I personally have found that it is quite difficult to get um, some clients, if not many of them, to drink a very strong infusion. Because in order to get the medicinal benefit from it, you do have to steep it for long periods of time. And so for that reason, you know, something that might be a little bit more concentrated like a tincture or other type of extract might be easier for compliance purposes. However, um, you absolutely can do strong infusions for four plus hours, and that's actually a viable way of using those herbs. Um, I personally have just found that compliance goes up when clients have to take less of that herb. 
Wonderful, thank you. Our next question is from Dawn. She says, will you touch on the use uh, of herbs with elderly and children? Yeah, great question. So um, for children, typically dosing is going to be a little different um, because they're, they're smaller than adults and tend to not need um, the same type of concentration. And there are also some herbs that are contraindicated for um, use with children. However, herbs are really great for children too. So um, elderberry, for instance, is a great one that I like to recommend for kids. One, because it tastes really tasty and it's great as an immune support. Um, typically, and this is gonna be herb dependent, but I usually uh, start with like half of the adult dosing of herbs. And depending on the age of the child, you might not necessarily want to do an alcohol extract. So in these instances, maybe doing a syrup or um, a vinegar might go over a little bit better depending on the child's flavor preferences. Um, as far as elderly goes, um, oftentimes elderly can use uh, the recommended dosing for adults. However, um, we do wanna be conscientious of any type of medication, contraindications or interactions. So definitely be on the lookout for that. Um, elderly do tend to be taking more medications than um, some of the, our younger folk. And so definitely keep an eye on that and just make sure you do your research so that you're not offering a, you know, an herbal cocktail, so to speak, that might counteract or um, have a contraindication with any of their medications. Wonderful. And we do have a, uh, one more question. Um, again, we'll, we'll, uh, refer everyone back to you um, for any additional specific question they have on herbs. Um, will you uh, provide copies of your PowerPoint today to everyone um, on our registration list? Yes, I am happy to do that. So um, I'll go ahead and talk with Yasmin after this call and I'll make sure that she has copies of the slides and can send it out to anyone who has registered. Wonderful, thank you so much. So uh, again, if you have any questions, Sierra's information is here on the screen. Um, we will actually be sending out another email with more information. I'll get into that in just a second. And we can, we can provide you with her information in case you don't have a pen on you today to jot all that info down. So as a thank you to everyone who registered for this event today, Wise Woman is offering 15% off of your next order using promo code ST. 1018. All practitioner accounts will be eligible to purchase the Botanical Fundamentals Kit at a special practitioner price of $89. The regular retail price of this kit starts at $179, so that's a great deal for everyone today. And please note that additional 15% off discount, uh, unfortunately, cannot be applied to that special uh, practitioner pricing of the kit. And if you don't already have a practitioner account, please contact Wise Woman Herbal's customer service department, and one of our lovely team members will be happy to assist you in setting up your account so that way you can take advantage of today's promotions and practitioner wholesale pricing. And their information is on their screen, so the customer service number is 541-895-5172, or you can email them at wise, the number one, at wisewomanherbals.com. Again, we'll be sending out an email, a uh, thank you email to everyone who registered for today's webinar that will have all this information that I just mentioned, Sierra's information. Um, it'll have the replay link for the webinar and the herbal actions and applications pamphlet that uh, Sierra created. So on behalf of everyone from Wise Women Herbals, we thank you again for joining us today, and we look forward to seeing you on our next webinar. Take care. <laughs>